wow, I'm on tilt. Ah, there we go. I'm not tilted anymore. Oh my god. I am exhausted. Story time. Oh, gosh, I'm also going to need Kleenex because I've been having jalapeno hot sauce. I don't have any nearby here. Damn it! I ran for a whole hour because one of the absolute panaceas for any, excuse me, anxious, stressed, depressed, or not feeling good kind of feeling apparently is running. I don't know why bodies are dumb, where I'm like, oh god, I'm feeling anxious, maybe I didn't succeed in life and I've made bad decisions, and then I run and my body's like, we're fine, who gives a shit? Like, I don't know what it is, I have no idea how the body works that way, but I ran for a full hour today. Ooh, And I haven't been lifting, so I have flabby arms. And then I was getting ready to make a quick bite to eat before showtime, and then I realized I don't have any food in this house at all. Do you realize how hard it is to make yourself walk to the grocery store after you've just run for an hour as someone who is not really a runner? I trudged my way there. Got the groceries, trudged back. 15 minutes late, but by God, we're here. And we're feeling good. We've walked the Sean. And in today's episode, we are going to be playing these three decks. I'm actually going to kick it off with some red deck wins. These are the three strongest decks, in my opinion... In my opinion, I don't actually know what the statistics are. I think that the Jeskai uh, fires is very, very good. But the the I want to briefly discuss what makes these three decks so good. Red deck wins is an unusually mid-range construction. Unusually so. Running 21 lands instead of the sometimes typical 18-19 has... Three copies of an axe. This is a very essential card for this deck because it allows the opportunity to refill the board up with small dirtlers to enable the four copies of Embercleave. And also goes for some longevity with four Bone Crusher Giants, plus light up the stages. It's a really interesting deck that really, really, really tries to leverage the um, extra value you get out of Rimrock Knight, Bone Crusher Giant, light up the stage, and axe to be able to summon Embercleave. I'm really excited about this one. Azorius Control, you may have seen me do some uh, variants of an enchantment-heavy version of this, and there's been some experimentation, but uh, the Azorius Control lists have kind of fallen back to some of the archetypical strong ones. Uh, first of all, it has four sweepers, Runs four Absorbs. I've even seen lists that run four Dream Trawlers. Elspeth Conquers Death is so good at eliminating things, resummoning back the Dream Trawlers that may have been countered. But then also, <clears throat> four Teferis and three Narsets as the traditional blue-white chokers. You don't get to draw cards. You don't get to cast spells. Also, go fuck yourself, right? It has the usual sort of list. I think the things that are very interesting, the things that at least are personally very exciting for me, Birth of Miletus is a very interesting, strong, defensive... Uh, card Omen of the Sea, another very nice um, replacement for an opt due to the scry capabilities Thassa's Intervention, a counter spell that occasionally is just draw, very nice running two of, kind of like that you would with a syncopate, because X costers are a bit of an issue, and then the Thirst for Meaning, the ability to draw three cards and then just discard an Omen of the Sea or discard a Birth of Miletus but Team of Reclamation is the one that I think we'll probably close out on. I've been having so much trouble beating this deck with any of my experimental ideas. So much trouble. And it's an extremely straightforward deck. We try to draw and gain some mana. Try to draw and gain some mana. Oh, let me sweep the board from all your threats. Hmm, I'm running low on cards. Well, I have Thassa's Intervention to look really deep. Uh, you know, I can get a bunch of land out with my Gross Spirals and Uros and then just look at the top 10 cards thanks to Wilderness Reclamation. And then I just find exactly what I need. And in worst case scenario, we have Gadwick to literally draw like 12 cards or something ridiculous. Um, I've even seen some lists run four Gadwicks. So this is what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to start off, I'm actually just going to go straight into best of three as I really like it. And apologies for doing some mute eating on air at the start. I mean, typically I eat most of my lunch and then I sort of snack for a few hours afterwards. Help even the energy level. Um, but we're actually going to be a proper horker. 
this is an excellent opening hand. Um, the th this card will very much so be the card that I misplay the most. I don't know when I'm supposed to just play the Rim Rock Knight versus actually try to cast the plus two plus O. Oh. So I think a reasonable starting plan for us is, dude, I'm just going to try to cast this adventure every single time. <laughs> Tigger Tag says, I thought the hot sauce bottle was bourbon. He was brazenly pouring on his food. Now, I, uh, because I have the Mythic Champion, I'm not, God damn, I'm going to fuck that up so many times. The World Championship, because I'm hosting the World Championship, uh, and I've been having some anxiety. I'm doing no alcohol, sleeping a lot, and trying to run about 20 to 25 miles a week just to get all that extra energy out of me. Trading here actually seems fine. Here is an actual spot where I think this is an okay maneuver. <laughs> Here's the moment that I really want to point to that makes me absolutely adore this red list. Um, typically, if you just get your Dirtlers killed early on, like, obviously we're playing against a mono red deck, but sometimes you can be up against um, just maybe a Jeskai control, maybe some sort of, um, really any list that just has some beaters in it. You can have something like this, and after those first two turns, have eliminated your early creatures, you feel screwed. But thanks to some of these extra reach possibilities with an axe. An axe is just so good at being a persistent threat all on its own. Alright, we're gonna go ahead and get Moonbopped. All right, so we have enough for the Ember Cleave, and this is mostly death. This will give this double strike and trample. And don't forget that the extra devotion from the Ember Cleave also applies to an axe. So, I mean, I, I got completely gutted in my first few turns, and it wasn't a big deal at all. Now, how the hell do I play this list out? I think I know the solution, but I'm going to just keep chomping on chunks of this burrito. Yeah, he went from 19 to dead. It's very, very strong. Cornethos is some of the strongest devotion I've seen since besides black. I think black, mono black devotion is a weak deck. And I know I love to shit on Gary. I mean, obviously, um, the Grey Merchant of Asphodel is a very strong high end for mono black devotion. But I think that the rest of the deck is not proactive enough. Because the thing that historically was really nice about Grey Merchant of Asphodel, and yes, I went back and looked at some of its dominating performance in the previous Theros. Um, but. Um, what made it so strong is that mono black or black focus decks could typically get down to 6 to 10 health, but couldn't really finish. And Gary would just pop him in the face. Um, I think I have a very simple construction here. We're red versus red aggression. I'll come back to mono black. We're red versus red aggression. Protection from white doesn't make sense. Stopping life gain doesn't make sense. And something that makes the game go on longer, I think, also doesn't make sense. I think that the weakest card here is the Rimrock Knight. We have a lot of tools to blow each other up. So trying to spend my Rimrock Knight buffing a target that could then get killed and send the Rimrock Knight in uh, to the graveyard directly, I think this is the correct cut. It also keeps our curve exactly the same. The best thing in that deck is the Nightmare Shepherd. I, I agree with that assessment, Thunderlock. I think that's a very fair statement. I think a lot of the struggle that the mono black decks have is that they have like 
Cauldron Familiars, Knight of the Ebon Legion, things like this, which don't really deal a lot of damage early when followed up with an Ayara, which can draw cards and help ping. Followed up with a Midnight Reaper, which is a little bit fragile. Emra says, what's the choice reasoning between Lava Coil versus Shock with this deck? Shock for faster use with how fast it is? Um, I just want to make sure you're referring to the what, what I think you're referring to, because this deck main boards four Shocks. There's four in the main already. I believe this is the correct play. I just want to make sure I understand your question, Emra. Boy, I feel sharp and focused today, man. I've been sleeping incredibly. I've been exercising. I've become more powerful than humanly possible. My rib shit is still in, in agony, but that's okay. Well, I think the choice is clear. We'll play the urban champion. Ah, uh, why not two and two main deck, for instance? Ah, yeah. Totally fair question. Uh, and the... Really? The big reason is one mana versus two mana is an extremely significant difference when you are a fast, fast deck. For instance, let's say that I didn't have a creature. On this turn, I could have shocked the face and then lit up that stage. Just like this. That is some bad news for me. <laughs> Shit. Well, I think we're going to be up against an axe. We've seen no turn one. We've seen no turn two play. That's fine as well. My god, that's right. Some of these lists run infuriate. All right, that's my bad. That's okay. That is a okay, okay. So, one of the th reasons why I cast the um, Bone Crusher Giant on the Steamkin instead of the Shock or the Lava Coil is first of all, Lava Coil, I am largely going to preserve for an axe. Because I want that exile effect to trigger. This could be an additional infuriate. I'm actually going to do... This looks like a very weird play. This will give us a lot of information. W what is this final card from Bleats? Is it another infuriate? I'm going to let my fervent champion die. Because now when I lava coil this, if this is an infuriate, it dies guaranteed. The fact that there was a block there makes it look a little bit like there would have been a way to combat trick or first strike. Huh. I, I, I don't fully stand behind this choice to run experimental frenzies in the mirror. I think. I think, I think, I think. We got off to an awkward start by whiffing our land. So who knows? We'll see in our follow-up. Get me out of here! Whiffing land with 21 feels pretty bad, Monored. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I think I'm going to just stick with the exact same plan as before, I think.
just finishing lunch as fast as I can. <clears throat> so we're gonna send the Scorch Spitter in. One of the reasons why the one drop of choice that we're putting in, we have four of our um, Fervent Champions. We also have four Scorch Spitters. But why Scorch Spitter instead of this other one? Well, because when we attack, we don't need to guaranteed hit the face. We can just send in the Scorch Spitter. It automatically pings and, and procs light up the stage. We see another turn two do nothing, which is a little concerning. It means that Bleats has a handful of removal or a handful of Ember Cleave and Experimental Frenzies. Alright. I'm going to send in the attack. This will probably be a no block. At which point we just play the Bone Crusher Giant. And we walk away as a happy camper. Alright, let's see what Bleats does. I'll probably... This is whenever it attacks, if the defending player has more cards in hand, and I have the same number of cards in hand. Let's see what happens here. <clears throat> I mean, we're very obviously going to bonk the Runaway Steamkin and then swing with our Ember Cleaver. And is this lethal? If we, On the Swank back? Let's get rid of this one. It'll get a 1-1, one -one, but that 1-1 one -one can't block, so that's fine. Now it's time for mathematics. If I swing with both of these and play this, my total devotion will be five. That will set this to six. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible attack. <clears throat> also, by the way, note that the cap, Castle Embrith, no blockers. All right, got him. Number one. Seems like a good play. I don't think that we die here. I don't think. But anyways, this um, Castle Embrith has extra synergy with uh, Anax because this plus one plus O to all creatures, Anax is making a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe we did die. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. I don't know what there is to learn about this game. I mean, it's the mirror matchup, so, you know, we, we got the chance to see what's good about it. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Alright, what did we learn? That Embercleave is a good card. Infuriating loss. Ah, oh, it's no big deal. It's not a big deal. This does not seem like the best hand. You know, I'm going to keep this to help explain why I think that this is not such a strong hand. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that if they ever see, like, half lands, half creatures, they're like, we did it! Boo! But, um, really, I'm looking for some curve and stabilizing cards. And I think the stabilizing ones are going to be the um, Bone Crusher and Anax. They're a little slower of cards, but they give us a good amount of resilience and a good amount of value. Whereas Scorch Spitter, Torbrand, it's going to be a little bit longer of a run out. There are some top decks that we could draw. I'm going to swing into the first striker. It's pretty obvious. Are we going to be mono red versus mono red all day? Is this what's going to happen? Is this what's going to happen? Alright. 
Is matchmaking based on deck type, card type, or truly random? Um, <laughs> this matchup is so, so funny, man. Oh my god. Alright, Runaway Steamkin, swing with the team, right? Oh. Embercleave, who wore it better? I think I just like automatically win, right? I just Embercleave this and it deals infinite damage. Isn't that correct? I mean, this is this is how I just lost, right? So if I Embercleave this, this gets buffed by three. Jesus, man, this is, look at this. Oh my god. Alright, well, I mean, uh, you know, you guys are interested in seeing the ins and outs of Red Deck wins. You know, let's just dilly dally around you a little bitty. Alright, I'm gonna, I, I gotta blow my nose, man. Ugh, so much jalapeno hot sauce. What hot sauce am I having? I'm having, um, I'm having Trader Joe's. Let me re-screw this top on properly. Trader Joe's jalapeno hot sauce. I really like jalapeno-based hot sauces a lot. I, I mean, I love jalapeno so, so much. Um, <clears throat> By the way, I just want to stress, the whole reason we were able to win that last game, the reason I kept that hand was to show some of the vulnerabilities that can happen on turn two and three, because even though this does kind of have a later curve, it does need to hit shit on curve. This is almost identical of a hand. It was Scorch Spitter, Torbran, Ember Cleave. But in this case, I feel a lot of versatility due to this little combination. Combination. But yeah, I love essentially any jalapeno hot sauce. I love jalapenos. I love just eating jalapenos straight up. Oh my god. I'm gonna go ahead and swing. I mean, we are, we are vulnerable to two damage, but, like, I think my opponent's gonna be bonked anyways. What about habaneros? Habaneros, um, I'm sort of mixed on it. All right, I'm going to shock right now because there is no ter there is no two mana play coming because we see a scorch bear down right now. All right, we we also we also have the look and feel of a dead dude. I'm gonna hit no attacks. My opponent's on one land, and I don't actually have a play. Okay. Bring it on, bastard. <clears throat> this is what I mean by having stabilizing cards like this. Bone Crusher Giant is very nice for guaranteeing turn two, three plays. Yeah, ha habaneros sometimes are a little strong for me. Okay, someone someone has been practicing being a technologist. All right, I'm just gonna try to end the game now. All right. One of the real vulnerabilities to mono red decks is not drawing any land at all. I'm a thinker. Put me in the smart man seat. B. 
beautiful curve out. One, two, three. I am incredibly surprised when I'm playing this deck just to see how resilient it is to sweeps and removal cards. Alright, we see the good old Esper colors. We didn't see a Thought Erasure. This could be a Tyrant Scorn. I think it's fine to run the Runaway Steamkin out anyways. This looks like what Soul Gravier was waiting for. Wait till end of turn to see if there's the best possible Tyrant Scorn target. Let me tell you, Esper decks that don't have a play on turn two are either waiting to do something or... They whiffed incredibly hard. <clears throat> An axe is so good because whenever any non-token creature dies, you create satyrs. see here. I don't think there's going to be a lot of life gain in this deck. I don't think I need the shocks. I think the experimental frenzies are going to be good here. I think I'll try one. I mean, I don't really see what else I should cut. I mean, I'm just going to be Trying to deal a lot of damage, getting a lot of value. I don't... Opponent goes first. Yeah, I'll hang on to this one. This is this is actually a very acceptable starting hand thanks to this light up the stage that's right there. And the fact that I always get there don't have any damage. Yeah, I, I like Tybalt over Experimental Frenzy for Oath of Kaya. I'll be pretty honest, I don't know exactly what this list is running. <laughs> okay, this is an incorrect attack. This is an incorrect attack. I should have hit with two. Make no mistake, I should have hit with two. But this is way too funny. I am absolutely susceptible to funny plays. I should have hit with two, played the light up the stage to help smooth out my draws. Because if it's land, cry the Carnarium, we are totally fuck a -ronied. Now what could happen is end a turn Tyrant Scorn into follow up Kaya's Wrath, but this just immediately annihilates Kaya's Wrath. I think this is the best card in the deck, man. Five? I'd love five. Still incorrect not to play the light on the stage. Still not correct. Entropy says, sorry I asked earlier and missed if I got an answer. How does Torbran interact with Double Strike? Yeah, so what happens is, let's say I have a 3-3 three, three with Double Strike. Let's say I have a 3-3 three, three with Double Strike and I have a Torbran down. Torbran says, if a red source would deal damage, it deals that much damage plus two. And let's say that the opponent double blocks. And there is a creature with three health and a creature with two health. What happens? What actually happens is the first attack in the double strike will assign three damage because that's how much damage you have to assign. So you can only hit the first one for three. When you hit it for three, five damage is applied to that one and it dies. 
Here's what does not happen if there is a three health blocker and a two health blocker, or excuse me, a three toughness blocker and a two toughness blocker. If I have three damage coming in, in double strike, what doesn't happen is that it just deals a total of five, three to this, then two that rolls on. Again, you start with dealing three damage because that's the base power of the attacking double striker. You assign the three damage to the first blocker and then five damage happens because of Torbrand. So it's important to note that you assign who's going to receive what damage and then it happens. So if for instance, I had Trample Oh, fuck. I can't remember the trample damage. I can't quite remember the trample interaction. It's really fascinating. Ang8011 says, I will always appreciate Red Deck Win for keeping the meta honest and not let decks that want to sit around for the first eight turns to get too popular. I think this is a really interesting design question of like how to actually work with that because first of all let's be very honest what if you assign two and one of the blockers and it will deal four and three to the blockers Now, to note, if you have a three damage or three toughness and a two toughness, I can't just arbitrarily assign three damage. Excuse me, arbitrarily assign one damage and one damage. I can't just do it arbitrarily. I have to deal lethal damage to the first one. Um, so I'm going to come back to Ang's comment about red deck wins, and I want to talk about this matchup because this appears to be teamer reclamation. So what I very obviously need to do is kill as fast as humanly possible against any deck that has a sweeper an axe is one of the most important cards to have this is why i think this is uh, why i consider this like an mvp of this deck i mean it grows as you play more stuff has resilience to sweepers. I mean, the, this fucking deck is just so strong, man. Cast the second Anax, you can get Anax and Four Satyrs. I don't, um... You don't get Four Satyrs, I just get a pair of Satyrs. I would just get a pair of Satyrs if it died. Because this says if you have uh, Power 4 Greater, create two of those tokens instead. Um, and, and I'm also not super needy in terms of getting a ton of Satyrs out. I, I think I want the Sweeper Insurance. Oh, you get the Death Trigger for both? Oh, nice call, nice call. They both proc. I see. Nice. Um, what do we not need in this matchup? Okay, well, this is a matchup where I think we don't really need shocks. Uh, hell, let me let me look at the sideboard plan for this deck real fast. For the other deck. Um, I can't remember what's in the Teamer Reclamation sideboard, but I'm sure it's a bunch of direct damage things. Some Chandra's Pyrohelix. Scourge and Dragon Fairs. So we're going to want a lot of this and this in here. But I'm not sure what the cut is. I think I want to do something like this. 
something like this. Yeah, but I mean, outside of the doubling up of uh, an axe, this will be fine. Outside of the doubling up of an axe, um, I, I, I want to keep plans for recursive possibilities. So, like, if there's a sweeper and then a bunch of satyrs pop down, I want to be able to replay an axe so I have more layers of resilience. What control deck is best against Mono Red? I think Azorius control is quite good. I think this Team of Reclamation deck is honestly quite good. I usually look up meta decks. I like MTG Goldfish. Aether Hub's fine. Uh, read articles on Channel Fireball or TCG Player. Get huge! I have a feeling that my opponent has a Brazen Borrower, so I'm actually not going to cast a spell to buff this. Hi, my name is Sean, and I don't understand my own feelings. Tebald. So this is uh, the reason I really like this card in this matchup. Show us you're alive. Is that Uro often is the stabilizing tool. This is very fascinating tech. to do here. I'm fucked. <laughs> I think I think I think death is our technique here. What other things are in this sideboard? I've never seen Hmm. I'm actually doing this, but this is this is a little dicey because I'm like I don't I do not have a ton of creatures, man. Probably cut a Torbrand, get back one of these guys. I don't want like a lot of lava coils. I think maybe I should have waited a little bit. This is a great hand. You would have wiped the board if you had double activated Embrith. I could only single activate. I had two Embriths and four mana. Come back to a comment that Ang8811 made, which is, dude, I love that red deck wins exist to prevent these decks that go on for like way too many turns. And I want to echo the ever living fuck out of that sentiment, dude. I am so happy that decks like this exist. I think there's a question of, okay, what does it mean to have an aggro deck in any game? 
it, it's really a, it's just a boundary condition. It, and by boundary condition, I mean no matter how slow of a deck you want to try to build, you eventually must accept that you will rub up against this very fast construction. No matter what you do, you have to account for the fact One land, one time Oof, what a tease I think this is actually correct to do No matter what you do, you have to account for a way to not die. If you're playing StarCraft, you have to account for a way to not die to a rush. The entire metagame of Dota 2, the idea of having three carries and two supports. I should say a hard carry, a mid uh, laner. Position three and two supports, all of this exists because there's this idea of like, dude, I don't actually know if we have enough stuff. So my opponent obviously has a solution for this. I think this is the best play, is just to attack. Sean could have swept the board. Uh, give me a screenshot of what you're talking about. Always always give your pal Sean a screenshot if you're talking about something old. What? What is it? I don't need that. See? See, I knew it. I knew I knew I shouldn't have equipped the Ember Cleave on the dude, because it would have gotten gusty busty. In Dota, technically the best strategy is to have five super hard carries and just let them farm till the 80 minute mark. But aggro behavior exists to be a wall against that. And so I think the question um, that I I'm really interested with the way that Fuck. I'm really fascinated with the way that um, Wizards of the Coast has answered it. Is they have an aggro deck, but very clearly they're 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 broadening the amount of turns of gameplay that can occur. Oh, we might be dead here. And this is one of the reasons why I think this Teamer Reclamation deck is just very, very, very strong. Yeah, in, in, in Dota, and actually in every single MOBA, technically, if you were not pressured, the best thing you could do is get a bunch of super hard carries that farm super, 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 super well. Or I should say work with farm super, 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 super well. Hundred percent sure what the, what the right play is. Aren't there diminishing returns with limited farm though? Well, Silvos, you don't need to worry about wait diminishing returns with limited farm. No, no, no. Well, okay, let me let me really emphasize what I'm saying. In every single game, there exists an idea. I should be very specific. In every single game where you have some power growth, like Magic, you can get more cards and more land and more resources. If you uh, have Dota, this is getting more experience and more items and more farm. If this is StarCraft, this is getting more minerals and gas and bases uh, and shit and upgrades. Um, and what I'm, what I'm saying is that in all of these games, there is always going to be boundary strategies that prevent people from focusing fully on the resource growth side. You can't infinitely um, delay doing anything on the board in Magic the Gathering because you'll die to something like red, red Deck Wins. In StarCraft, you can't infinitely expand because you'll eventually die to someone who attacks or rushes. And in Dota, 
technically, and actually in any MOBA, technically, if you were left alone and there was no pressure, there was no threat, there was nothing, the best thing to do is to just pick the hardest carry of all. Pick five of the hardest carries of all. Wait until all of them have six slots of the best items, and then begin fighting. However, the reality of Dota is that you can't do that. The reality of League is that you can't do that. Why? Because there's people who are attacking and pressuring and trying to kill you faster. This is this is really the, the essence of any game with growth. And by growth, I mean power growth that's happening in it. You have the win condition that you're going for. You have the resource growth that you're going for. And every strategy has a relationship to these two things. Red deck win is just trying to win the... I can't remember which hand is which. Red deck win is trying to satisfy the win condition as fast as possible. Azorius control is trying to slow the game down a shitload and just get so many resources that eventually they'll win like that. This is a terrible hand because I don't have any good plays right now. This is a pretty damn good hand. And I think I actually send the Scorch Spitter back because I have two rushies. So I, I did delay this. I could have gone land for and champion, but I want to do this because if I get two lands out of this, I want to be able to play both of them. Shouldn't do this now then. Pretty MTG has been one of my personal highlights 2019, meeting you in Long Beach. End of last year, keep up the great work. Hey, cheers to you, Pretty MTG. Happy to have you here. I think missing three damage is the wrong play. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to really figure out how this deck plays optimally. Because it's, it's very weird from a lot of the existing red decks that I've played. Because there's... There's so much you can do by being efficient. When you couldn't do that with traditional Landos. Hello, I am Death. Get down the land. So that's a really good way of explaining value versus tempo. Value is getting more resource growth from your expenditure, whereas tempo is moving towards the end condition of the game. I agree that value is about... the relation to... Let me do the sideboarding. No, 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 no. I'm going to try to keep the Rimrock Knights in here. And instead get in the... Tybalt, Rakish, Instigator, and the Experimental Frenzies. Value is a term that comes from trying to succeed the best at the resource game. Tempo is not exactly about... It's not fully just about trying to do the win condition-y stuff. Because tempo is like a, even a little more abstract than that. Tempo, I think, is a fascinating term. I can describe instances of tempo, but I've always struggled to give, like, a really clean, like, here's what tempo is. Tempo is generally the idea of sacrificing potential long-term value in order to make substantial progress towards the win condition, which is different than just making progress towards the win condition. Do I want to do this right now? I can actually just play the knight. And it really is about that sort of sacrifice. 
Like, this is not... I'm not really sacrificing, like, long-term success. I'm just, like, going all in. Um, and, and the example that is historically pointed to is a card that says, Return three things to your hand. I have spent a whole card to delay the presence of your three cards. You will eventually get to replay those cards. And after you have replayed those three cards, the net effect at that point is just that I've thrown some value into the bin. Alright, I, I, you know. If we don't draw an axe, we're fucked. I'm actually gonna take a peek at a different red deck wins list because there, there's been some changes to these lists that have been really interesting or or have these sort of settled Well, this is an interesting list as well. I'm going to try this slightly different list. Kind of has some of the same ideas. If we take a peek at this list, it, it's kind of some of the same ideas, um, except it's a little lower on the curve. Instead of Rimrock Knights and Bone Crusher Giants, we favor the aggression. We favor getting 10th Street Dodger and Infuriates in. Still have the Shock, still have the Light Up Stage. We also have another Charger and Phoenix of Ash. We have no Tor brands. We have some more, um, like, anti-red tools. We have this sort of anti-cat tool, which does not actually seem that, that necessary. Chandra is the... Yeah, these are more of the uh, aggro, or excuse me, anti-control uh, things. Unchained Preserve are also reasonable against Mono Whites. Yeah, but, 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 like, again, in this tempo example, if I spent a card to bounce three of your creatures back to your hand, if you eventually replayed those, we would just say, well, Sean just lost value. He just cast a card to put these things back, and eventually they came back to play. But the idea is that tempo is in the period of time before you could replay them, that's where I was really hurting you. Yeah. I'm not the hugest fan of 10th Street Dodger. I think to be super clear, the reason 10th Street Dodger is run at all is this one. Can't be blocked except by creatures with Defender, which allows this light up to stage to get triggered. Hey, it's Birth of Miletus. Well, farts. Block me. I've not seen a terrific amount of Esper lists that run Birth and Melita. If they do, they only, they only really run like five planes. There's just not a lot of space in there. And then the deck, therefore, has to skew all white. But, you know, it's fine because you have the... Zeus is okay. Ferrovax. Everyone's favorite dragon, hoping to see you on July 14th in Peace Talks. God, I really want to see Faravax. What a cool guy. Pretty you don't know, my favorite book series is having book... Fuck, what number is it? Changes is 12, Ghost Stories 13, Cold Days is 14, Skin is 15, so it's book 16! Book 16! Oh!
This is my everything. My name is Dr. Totally Fuckdenstein. Trawler is good. So this is one of the benefits of running four Infuriates. You can wind up in good trade situations like this. This is less a, a less value thing. Sucks. Do you double on the Phoenix to go uh, to Tradesville? If my opponent blocks, my opponent misses it. Sure. If my opponent totally whiffs on the obvious play, then yes, we can get him. And this is why I was bringing up the Infuria. Is Infuria is has a little bit more stealth to it. Obviously, this is not on the board. Seeing that thing makes my limited heart ache. Dream Trawler, I think, is a really nice card in Constructed. It feels really nice. Fucking ass. Here he comes. Here comes the day nine. He's a demon on wheels. If you want the deck, it's located right on your screen. You don't even need to type anything in chat. You just click right there. I don't really have any bots that print almost anything up in this channel. I actually gotta be honest, I am like endlessly surprised when I look at the Twitchosphere and see like tickers sliding around on everyone's screen and like bots that just spam information and like notifications that take up like 80% of the screen. I mean, I'm like really surprised I'm not surprised that it exists in some locations. I'm surprised it exists in, like, particularly new streamers. I mean, it, it like, it's just... It's just enormous. It's just uh, so visually loud. Like, we, we have a ticker. A lot of people don't even know that there's a ticker on the screen. Holy, I am so screwed. It's really subtle. The Day9 TV logo gradually fades into the newest subscriber and then gradually fades away. Because I only need one location for it. I don't even wear big blocky headphones, right? Sometimes I don't even wear headphones at all. <laughs> I just wear like earbuds. Well, aren't you late to the party, you fuckhead? Alright, let's get out of here. Yeah, see, look, see, look. Ticker just transitioned in the top top right. We just saw AJ Sharer BCC. Isn't that great? Yeah, I realized it did that. Yeah, it's very, very subtle. <laughs> The shocks seem rather useless. Light up the stage. Our card draw is probably fine. I'm going to move it to this two-drop slot just for ease of demonstration. Tin Street Dodger does have some value issues because my opponent does have creatures with Defender. Now, cards, I do like this, 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 and I also like these three. M Unchained Berserkers. I think I'm just going to get rid of the Tin Street Doogers. Do-gooders. This looks good to me.
Grinning Duke says, when you're trying to balance the whole power growth versus win now mentality, how do you know how much stall or tempo type cards to put in? That, my friend, is why magic is such a damn hard frickin' game. Jeezy Louisey. And for me personally, I can make a lot more sense out of the power growth type goals. For two reasons. One, I think, I mean, that's how I played StarCraft. Was a, make the game go on longer. Make the game go on longer. Let's stretch this puppy. So I play this first. Swing, and then bonk the light up the stage. Bye. Yeah, I kind of had a feeling that was coming. Is it this one or this one? I actually don't, you know, fuck. That is such a hard choisy say. I, th I think it's actually this one. Fight for your right to win. Now, if there is Akaya's Wrath this next turn, I'm gonna poke myself in the eye. Ah, oh, shit. All right. Ha ha! I'm back. I mean, I see no reason to change the plan sub substantively. Gotcha. Is Talos Principle worth playing? One of the best games I've ever played. Best of ism. The only reason I didn't beat it is I accidentally deleted several hours of my progress. Speaking of accidentally deleting several hours of my progress... Oh, I, sorry, let me back up. Because talking about value versus tempo, I think for me, it, intuitively in StarCraft, I played very, very defensively, made the game go on longer and longer and longer. So I already have some pre-tuning in that regard. Defense. But the second thing is that I, I find it so hard to understand the kill play, you know, where you're looking around and you go, I can set up for a kill in two turns and you just go for it. There's something that feels so uncomfortable for me emotionally about giving up on future potential. What if something goes wrong in the next two turns, stuff like that. This is why I historically have said, I think that aggro decks is probably the hardest archetype to play in Magic the Gathering. Um, I just find it incredibly difficult to identify those moments that just like, ah, go for it. Whereas when you're trying to make the game go on longer, if at any point you die, you have such a clear question. How do I make it go on longer? I hate this hand, but it's reasonable enough, huh? Now about the Talos Principle, the Talos Principle is just a brilliant 3D puzzle game. It's like a pure puzzle game. But typically puzzle game... Like, I fucking like puzzle games, man. If you like puzzle games, you like me. I like puzzle games. But in my experience, puzzle games t tend to have this, like... Absent everything else that you see in games. You know? Like, if you play a game like Subnautica, it has a story and a world and sweet graphics and all sorts of sweet visuals and cool imagery. And then it has, like, the crafting component and it has this, like, experience. It's, it has, like, all the shit and it's voice acting and, uh, you know... Um, play a real-time strategy game, and let's be honest, real-time strategy is an extremely system-heavy thing. It's so system-heavy, holy shit. And you get story and cinematics and all this stuff, and most puzzle games are like, 
hey, if you like puzzle games, you'll love me. And then you play it, and it's just like a puzzle, daisy chain with a puzzle, with another puzzle, and there's just puzzle, and then it's puzzle. It's just like, there's no cinematics, there's no sound effects, there's no nothing. It's just the puzzles. But Talos Principle is a puzzle game that has an atmosphere, a story, a world. Did I play Baba as you? Baba as you is actually the example I should have chosen. Baba is you has this... Um, just, uh, it's puzzle, it's puzzle, it's a puzzle game, that's it. It is contextless puzzles, Daisy Chain. I'm gonna take a shit on this dream trawler, baby. Go, my friend. It's gonna go to fucking nine. But I mean, Talos Principle has voice acting, world ambiance, a story, beautiful environments, also really clever puzzles. It's, I would probably say it's one of like the top three puzzle games ever made. Hi, my name is Day Nine. This is me not drawing a third land. <laughs> This is someone's first time tuning in, and they're just like, Oh my god, they died! No! <laughs> How does he have viewers? It's a motherfucking land. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got that land, baby. All right. Now we're going even. This sucks. What are the best puzzle games ever? Um, I, I don't count Riven or Myst as puzzle games because they're really graphic adventure games. Uh, but those are really good. Does Portal count as a puzzle game? Probably. That's, pro that's probably got to be number one if we even count that as it. Oh my god, fuck. Oh my god, fuck. God. Junior Zelda puzzle game? I, I wouldn't. I, w I would consider those archetypical adventure games, even though adventure is the absolute blurriest, fuzziest, most identifiable listness. Don't worry, I got this. Aang says Baba is used probably the cleverest puzzle game I've ever played. That's That's got to be true. It, raise your hand if you have not heard of Baba is You. Who has not heard of Baba is You? Because I can't recommend this game enough. Haven't even heard of it? Okay. Um, the way the game works is... You, you will see... It, so, imagine a world of tiles. Right? So, there's little tiles. And... and You'll see three tiles in a row that say Baba is you. There's a Baba tile, an is tile, and a you tile. And you'll see that sentence on the screen. And you'll have a character named Baba that you move around. Do, 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 do. Get me the hell out of this game. This is just me getting slam dunked upon. <laughs> Baba is you. And... So you hit up, down, left, right, and Bob will tick, 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 move around on the tiles. You'll see another sentence that says, wall is stop. Again, three tiles. And then you'll have Baba moving around, because you control Baba, and then there's a wall. So you walk up to it, tick, 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 and you hit the wall. You can't go through it, because wall is stop. This means you can't go through the wall. Now, if you take Baba and move over to those three tiles, wall is you, and you push up on wall, You've broken the sentence. And now, Baba can move through walls because the sentence, wall is stop, doesn't exist anymore because you physically broke it. Now, you might be wondering, the next question, yes, if you take Baba and move that word wall, tick, 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 and move down to where it says Baba is you, and you take wall and you push down, so now you have the sentence, wall is you. Now, anytime you hit up, down, left, right, all the walls move. And the character Baba doesn't move anymore. 
Now, if you created, if you took Baba is you, and then you took the, the, the word wall and the word is and made the sentence wall is Baba and Baba is you, all the walls will turn into the character Baba. And when you move up, down, left, right, you'll have hundreds of Babas moving around. So it's the most mind-melting, mind-breaking puzzle game you will ever play because the rules of how that level works are objects in the level. So you rearrange the sentence to rearrange the level, or the level rules, so that you can complete the level. So for instance, you might have something like flag is win, baba is you, wall is stop. So you'll see the flag surrounded by walls. So you might be like, oh, I need to get Baba there. But the trick to doing this is you actually change a sentence to wall is you, and then you move the walls, that's you now, onto the flag, and that's how you're supposed to win. <laughs> it's so fucking interesting. And then you start to get into really complicated rules, like things, you know, like water is hot, baba is melt, means that, like, if baba touches something that is hot, baba will melt. It's, I mean, it's so abstract, man. It's me, I'm Croxa. I'll just note, I don't like this red list as much as the other red list. And when I say I don't like it as much, I mean I literally am not enjoying it as much. Because my personal preference is to things that are a little bit larger. Things that are a little bit more uh, mid-rangey. As opposed to things that are a wee bit more. I'm going to do this now because I have a sneaking suspicion that there's a second croc set in there. Correct move last turn for the wrong reason. An axe. Best card in the video game, huh? Yeah, main deck scry. <laughs> well, it's Grixis. Poop. Jurg says, Red doesn't have the best two drops right now. It's awkward. It, it's really kind of fascinating how it works. Hey. Hey, Mamma Mia. It's my friend Axe. I'd just like to stress that we got dumped on. And our opponent lost. I think that an Axe and some of these adventure cards are just brilliant. So we see the pieces for a traditional Grixis list. We probably won't need the shocks to pierce through things. We probably will love Chandra. We probably will love Experimental Frenzy. I don't actually know. I guess I'll just keep a shock in. Shocks are good against Thief of Sanity, I guess, says Jay Wava. Yeah, I would more describe it that if my opponent plays a Thief of Sanity, it is equivalent to them having not played a card. Because I just don't even give a shit. <laughs> Lidar says, Sean, what's your favorite keyword a card can have? I don't know, plus X, plus X. <laughs> Something with X in the cost. Trample, bigness. Yes, bigness is next to godliness, is next to dogliness. Banding for life. <laughs> Boo! Boo! Banning was a shit keyword, man. Banning, banding, 
I have reread what banning is 50 times. I have no idea how banning works, man. I hate banning. Banning confused the shit out of me as a child. I was just like, and then banning means that they become a creature, but then you can assign the way that I am assigning back to you because I am actually two creatures, but. Oh, fuck. Banding. Banning was a way for creatures to attack as a pair. It's basically like, you know, you get to be your very own Frankenstein. You get to sew up a little monster. I think I'm going to get rid of the Scorch Spitter because I want the land. Having the usual high variance red deck wins experience. You gotta get up to get down, you know what I mean? You gotta gain points to spew points. <laughs> I should probably probably chuck it. That'll do, pig. Pulling with the nerds. Why do I always have the trial from Chrono Trigger stuck into my head? It is just so kitschy. Catchy and kitschy. Combination I haven't seen in some time now. Alright, well, the very correct decision is to kill this. And then to get this stage all uplit. Do you play Factorio ever? I don't, Beamaloy. I, I, I'm very, very intrigued at twying it out again. Uh, we're playing Oxygen Not Included all day tomorrow as an investigation uh, into whether we should... as an investigation into whether we should just be straight up playing for a week. Finish Star Wars Fallen Order, what do you think about it? Eldixo, I would describe it as a, a, it's one of those perfect eight out of tens I've ever played, which is a very odd way to describe a game. But yeah, it, it's one of the most perfect eight out of tens that I've ever played. I say eight out of 10 because, um, Jedi Fallen Order didn't really do anything new. I mean, it basically has, like, a weapon. Holy fuck! That's bad! That's really bad for our red deck wins, but whatever. We have, we have, uh, Ember Cleave. That's fine. The level design had some Metroidvania-ishness to it, but not really in an extreme way. It wasn't one enormous contiguous world. Uh, you know, the, the the way that um, Fallen Order's levels felt is instead of the Metroidvania, I have access to 8%, and now 16%, and now 30%, and now 50%. Instead of this feeling of ballooning, it felt like I went from point A to point B, and then on the return path from B back to A, I found a different path I could take. That, that was more of my experience. Surprise, motherfucker. Uh, you know, th there was an RPG system in Fallen Order. It was not, or not RPG system, a progression system of, like, upgrades you could get, kind of RPG-esque. And... Not hugely different variant abilities that were in there. You know, you also had, like, the double saber and the single saber. We didn't have a huge weapon variety in there. Uh, most of the enemies were stormtroopers. 
you know, it wasn't, wasn't huge enemy variety. Um, but f and it was uh, graphically. I mean, I I can levy no criticism on the graphics at all. I think it's ten out of ten graphics. Just fucking amazing, and it ran beautifully on my uh, on my devices. Hello, my name is Day Nine, and I would like an Ember Cleave. I just chill here till we get the cleave, huh? And so, that's why I say it's like the most perfect 8 out of 10 I've ever played. Is that, like, honestly, the combination of a light RPG system, nice combat, some cool levels, some progression in what your character can do that ties into the levels, having some story... Getting all those to plug in together is actually so fucking hard. It's like I have this contact solution, and if I try to balance on top of it this contact solution, this will take me quite some time. There it is. I've done it. But if I want to balance another one on top of there, that's hard. And if I have five of them stacked, you're like, whoa! However, at the end of the day, it still just is stacking contact solution bombs. You know what I mean? It's so easy to just discredit how difficult it is because you go, oh, yeah, it's not that you know crazy in any particular direction. Um, I'm waiting for an Ember Cleave, and I'm not looking at this game. Let them fight. Watch out. Bye. Is there any farting way to do this? Am I still waiting on a dismember cleave? So I think that, like, uh, Fallen Order... I mean, maybe the only fault... But fault is such a bullshit word for me to use, but whatever. Like, maybe the only fault you could attempt to levy on that game is... Merely that it did not do an enormous amount new. But I still found it lovely. I didn't finish it because um, I sort of felt like I, I had gotten the experience. Like, if I just take a moment to think about one of the opening sequences in the game, where you're on a train in a somewhat stormy atmosphere. This will be fun to watch. And you're trying to battle to the end of the train. I mean, just graphically, it's... Oh, my fuck, it's so great. Oh, it's so great. Dark Souls really didn't have any of those, and I still love Dark Souls way, way, way more. Because it had the type of gameplay that just really shook me. Are we are we holy fucking bullied? Ho 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 ho! Yeah, we're getting out of this one. This is also one of the reasons why we see Ember or not Ember Cleave, uh, Phoenix of Ash being run. Phoenix of Ash. Um, deals with a pretty large variety of decks purely by virtue of being a flapper, man. It just flies over shit. And that's actually pretty, pretty damn important for closing out a number of matchups. Did I play Sekiro? Yeah, I th I found Sekiro okay. And again, I, a lot of times when people say, I found the game okay, they mean, I thought the game was okay. I think the game is marvelous. I, it's not really my jazz. Uh, well, it's just because other people don't speak precisely. And I speak precisely, you know. Delays a turn, but it's a pair of damages a turn, you know.
It's kind of interesting. You know, like, um, the, the way that I would describe the difference between, like, Dark Souls and Sekiro is obviously they are different games in a lot of ways, but they are also over-the-shoulder, third-person uh, combat games. So, what are the similarities between them? <laughs> but you, have you ever seen me beat Bloodborne? For any of you who don't know, I'm on the last boss in Bloodborne. And I just, I'm just like, alright, I've done everything except the very end. I spoiled the end sequence for myself by watching on YouTube, and now I'm good. <laughs> and if anyone's like, have you beaten Bloodborne? I'm like, oh, fucking of course, like so many times. <laughs> what am I talking about? But anyways, in, uh, uh, in Sekiro... In Dark Souls, I feel like there is a very concise understanding of combat, which is my opponent is going to have gaps in their animation where they are going to swing they're going to swing and then come back. They're going to swing and then come back. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand their patterns where there are those gaps. This is a waste, I don't give a fuck. You're trying to find the gaps in those patterns where you can get your swing in. And your swings have a very slow... Um, they just take a long time to, to go from start to finish. Boy, do I like our other deck more. I'm gonna get out of this game. And same with block. You can block things when you're trying to manage your stamina or you can roll to try to roll out of the attacks. So even though you have different weapons, and even though you're against different enemies, you're still kind of doing the same thing. It's block, duration of my attack, duration of their attack, when they're blocking and where they're, when they're not blocking, and when you can roll. And every boss is trying to figure that out. Whenever you do a new weapon in a run, you're trying to just get a feel for when you can squeeze in attacks and so I feel like I'm having this very symmetric experience from encounter to encounter to encounter to encounter. And I also have a very symmetric experience when I do a new run and try to use the Dragon's Tooth instead of the Balder Side Sword or whatever. The thing when I played Sekiro is it felt like it just had a completely different mental model to the combat it felt like it just went here's 70 tools that will make you feel like a ninja go and um it didn't really put a value judgment on what the goal was in any one particular situation because dark souls really felt like it was saying here's this opponent figure right figure out how to succeed at this particular encounter and then you, you have that little puzzle that you saw. Sekiro just felt very, um, very not that. Oh my god, magic is raiding, raiding with a party of 263. All right, guys, it's time to be on our best behavior. Hey, Magic the Gathering and Wizards of the Coast, I'd like to once again thank you for inviting me to host the World Championship. If I call it the Mythic Championship when I'm there, whoopsie doopsie, please don't fire me. I have accidentally called it the Mythic Championship every time I've mentioned it. <laughs> Coming up! Oh. So, I, I switched lists back to the uh, first red deck list that we were playing. The one that runs the Rimrock Knights that has a little bit more value, a little bit more... Uh, Duration, it feels like.
Fairfax says, I can't believe Day9 hasn't lost a game this stream. Truly a master of MTGA. It's so true. I, I mean, this might be incorrect. But I'd like to think that I've never been incorrect. <laughs> Marie says, oh, this is an interesting question for Sean. What's the game that made you feel the most creative? Well... As the official Magic the Gathering channel has just hosted this one, I feel like saying it's Magic the Gathering. I don't know why I find this so funny. <laughs> I, <don't know> why. <laughs> I have to say, upon reflection, it's gotta be magic. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, StarCraft, Magic, competitive games uh, are the ones that historically feel like they permit me to be far more creative than usual. I'm gonna go ahead and do the sort of obvious play the double runaway steam kid instead of just smashing the book leaf down. Because this, if we see white mana, we're up against some sort of odd trail of crumbs, Selesnia deck. If there is a Shatter the Sky, now we'll get one, two, three, four, five little tiny dudes. So. I've never seen a deck like this. But, you know, I, I, I really struggle with the type of red deck that was the second red deck that we played today because it's just so lean. There's so many one-mana cards... And I really struggle to understand when and how to dump all the cards down and smush through for the most amount of damage because that'll maximize the probability of winning this game. I feel so uncomfortable without some longevity. This is why I'm gravitating towards this list because I have this Rimrock Knight. If this board gets cleared, I have some other cards in my hand. Woohoo! Pull on your nose, the Unchained. Okay. So, we're going to have one, two, three, four attackers. Here's a fifth one. Bing bong. We can also play the Rimrock Knight to continue to buff stuff. And we can Swank. And, in a usual display of cunning, we'll play the Ember Cleave to allow us to bonk for one billion. Alright, I have no clue what my opponent is or was doing. But I think I'm just going to cut the shocks and put in the experimental frenzies and just call it a go. Oh. You ever thrown in a dual land color in a mono color deck just to mess with an opponent? No. <laughs> no, huh? Mm -mm. Super don't. What's your rank, Sean? Well, since the season reset, I've just been chilling at platinum. Platinum four. We we were we had our little mythic numbers at the end of the month and got reset. I've been trying to make this Naya Merriment with Calyx deck work, and uh, I'm pleased to report that it doesn't. <laughs> Do I think Embercleave is too good? Uh, I definitely don't think so, and I think that it creates an extremely narrow and interesting dynamic in games. I think this is okay. I think having no turn one play is okay here, because I have the Experimental Frenzy. Perfect.
the stuff I find really interesting about Embercleave as a card is that Embercleave creates a very clear goal and as a result a very clear counter goal for the opponent. If I have enough creatures out, I can I can mash an Embercleave forward. But it also has a very subtle secondary thing, which is I need to remove the creature that has the highest power on it. Because that is really where the big threats wind up landing. Like, if you have a 1-1, one, one, a 1-1, one, one, and a 1-1, one, one, maybe it's okay if there's an Ember Cleaver board. I gotta get some water. Dude, Mor Morneal, Morneal messages me, like, twice a week, being like, Hey, I hope you're drinking enough water. <laughs> Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I am, Hydrobot. All right. Loves Thwok Beast. What's your favorite kind of axe? Really? It's an axe. Uh, nah, I don't want to attack. <laughs> Grange says, I recently started a program to help me lose some weight, and while I drank a lot of water before... Oh man, do you drink water now? Let me tell you, Grange, if you want the real trick to weight loss and water... Put cubes of ice in that water. Make it so cold. Oh! Be slamming that chili wawa. Yeah, I guess I did just say wawa. That's something that has become me. My opponent's stuck on a pair, huh? Become huge. Shoot the bird. Time for our axe to become many smaller axes. Little pieces of axes. I am so thirsty, man. Morning would be disappointed in me. Yep, I wear green shorts every day. And that's what Christmas feels like. You just go away, you come to, and it's a present. What do you know? We're going to be playing this deck for 15 more minutes, this red deck wins deck. And uh, when we go to sideboarding in this game, I want to point to an error that I'm like slightly worried that I'm making frequently. Slightly worried. I'll show you. Yeah, my opponent is down to five cards. Excellent. 
So, I had a really fun experience last night. I tried to update Unity to a more recent version, and what it did was just break my C-sharp assembly, and I couldn't get it to stop, and I reverted back to the old version of Unity, and then for whatever reason, it still wasn't working. <coughs> yeah, you don't even care. You don't even care. You just want to be snugged. So I just had to completely rebuild a bunch of stuff from scratch. Hey, little bug. Come on. Guys, this is my cat. This is Sheriff. She's a very good cat. She likes shoulders. Oh my god, we are very happy. Alright, so far so good. One, two, three. One, two, three. Very simple sideboarding plan. Yeah, hi sweetie pie. How's your day been? Yeah. Yeah, just tuck your little head right in there. I didn't get to show you what issues I'm worried about with sideboarding, because we don't even know what our opponent is. I mean, I'll just describe the issue. I feel like there is, uh, typically when people are doing analysis of what's going right and wrong, it's very, very, very easy to think about how you're going to react to stuff. Ooh, I saw a Nightpack Ambusher. Let me put in some... Lava Coils. Ooh, I see that there's an Uro, so I'm going to play a Tybalt so that way they can't heal. But it's very easy to put in all these reactive ones to the point where when you look at your hand, you have like Reactive Spell, Tybalt, Experimental Frenzy, and a one drop. Whereas this is kind of like our starting to buy our starting build. Look at how many proactive get shit done cards we have. All right, thank you for thank you for that all that fur. Thank you for that little sweetie. Ah, I see it was an Esper deck. And our moment is done. Yes, Ghost Stalker knows the Jackson Galaxy. But what the fuck is going on here? What the fuck is even going on here? Holy shit, I think my chair's busted. Uh oh. You know? Oh. That's what this thing was. There was a weird little thing that. I picked up off the ground when it was dark this morning and threw it out, and then my chair's been a little weird. And so I just looked, and it is actually that chunk of chair. All right, let's see if I can fix this. Ugh. What is it that is going wrong here? I wonder where this screw comes from. You know, when screws start falling off your chair, I think you're supposed to be a little concerned. I should probably take care of that at some point. I just don't want to squish this cat. I've had this chair for a while, and I use it a lot. All right. Put this little chair over here. Well, I guess we're going to have to sit up straight. So if I, if I pull this all the way up, and then I... Huh. Oh my god, I can't actually adjust my chair at all. It, it just doesn't work. Let's look at the, the bonus damage. We might actually take just a real brief break before we uh, switch from one deck to the other. Might just like dip down onto the ground. Try to adjust. You'll hear me talking. I feel like I'm getting stuck on two lands a lot in this deck.
Coriolanus. I think that's it. I think that's the game. Oh, we're getting some hope. Coriolanus is Dana. My family's cat just got back from the vet with an immune issue and probably won't pull through. Would you do me a favor and give your cat a little extra love today? Thanks. Oh my god, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, oh losing little animals is it's just so difficult. Hope you and your family are holding up okay. And I will give my little kitties extra love and extra scritchies. I'm glad we have a large amount of animal lovers here. No! Those little animals are important. I think it's better to just play the Tor brand now. And a bing and a bong. your mug say? Dude, I don't even have a clue. It's in Korean. Oh, we are receiving the proper bing bongs. What to do? All right, that's definitely death here. After this game, we are going to switch to Azorius Control. We're going to close out the day with Teamer Reclamation. I think our I think our plan is okay. Maybe you do like this. This seems good. Didn't realize how much white was in there. Green just do you remember the stream the other day when Sean saw Dream Trial Unlimited and was just in a state of misery for like half an hour? Oh the absolute agony. My opponent just like slowly drawing and like just Stonewalling every attempt I had. Ugh! I wonder where this screw attaches to. So this... This one works fine on this side. How is Superland? Dude, Superland is a fascinating game, Xanake, man. It is fascinating! Oh! That's alright, I have enough mana to cast everything I, I know and love. Hi, Sean. My name is spelled S-E-A-N, Vicious Horizon. You see that and you're just like, no! I am about an hour out. I'm about an hour out. It's fascinating, because it's a game that was made by just one developer, basically. A developer who, like, paid a... Let's do this. Let's play this one. This could get countered, and that's okay. This is the one we don't want countered. Um, it, it's a game that's made by one developer, and... Oh, this is play so good. So consequently, like, every design decision... That you might see someone question, adjust, tune, or something like that. When you, when you have, like, one creator... You got me, I don't even care about this anymore. I really want to fix this chair. When, when you have, like, one creator just, like, doing everything, it's fascinating because you just get, like, a really strong sense of voice in there. And there's, like, a lot of elements in there that you're, like... Let me back up. When you're doing a creative project, often you'll wind up with two people pulling in opposite directions. And it's not that this direction is better than this direction, and it's about the debate and finding out the correct direction. The important thing is to note that they're just two different perspectives. So you just have to pick a perspective and go with it. Right? Like if you, uh, as a very simple example, if we wanted to make a movie together, and I'm like, I want to do an action movie, and you want to do a romance movie. These are just two different movies. You just have to pick one. And so often when you have very small teams or even an individual working, you all those points that could have been points of tension that would have slowed down development are just not there, and they just like go on and, and produce some stuff. Uh, and I, I've heard this described in a number of ways, and the best way to do it is with MS Paint. I've heard this described in uh, creative development, like here here is, here is, oh my god, I can't draw a circle, Jesus. 
this circle, this circle represents normal ideas and stuff. And anytime someone starts to go, ooh, I have an idea out here. It's at this location that I want to do. There is a natural pull that people will make to go towards the center. Here's the center. This is normal. Normal. And this, this is right at the edge of what would be considered normal. And so a lot of times when you have a like design by committee or you have a large group of writers in the room, it's very easy to wind up with like something that's just kind of like, yeah, it's like it's it's safe. These potatoes are within the realm of normalness. But a lot of times when you have a creator, like you'll you'll read about this with outsider art or um, uh, with authors who are just like writing really without formal training and stuff like this. Yeah, he recognizes PhD circle too. Yeah, yeah. This this is commonly used in research, but you'll you'll see someone who's just like, I'm gonna go explore a bunch of stuff here, and the reason they're able to go out here is that there's just no other forces pulling it in towards this kind of washed out normal. I've seen it before. It's the kind of it's the seven out of ten. It's the seven out of ten where it's just like, oh yeah, no, seems good. That all this stuff in here is a seven out of ten ideas. Out in this area in the dangerous forest, you have a lot of one out of tens. You have a lot of ten out of tens. And so when I'm playing Superland, man, I you are just seeing stuff that like I, I just don't see, I just don't see like anywhere in any other games. Because typically there's like more people that work on the game and sort of peel it back to normal, you know, like this. Some like crazy movement mechanics, like a gun that you fire and then you can right click and you can just teleport to that location. That's like just thrown in at the end. Normally there would be an entire game built around this one mechanic, but like in Superland, they're just like, yeah, no, fuck, we have this thing now. <laughs> like, it just like just like shows up. There's like there are so many more mechanics than you would expect in a normal game. It's it's awesome. So I'm gonna leave this up on the screen real fast and see if I can figure out where this screw comes from.